continue today talking about reconstruction of images from projections uh, with CT. Uh, what we'll do first is take a look. There's a couple of MATLAB scripts in the modules section of last week and this week uh, that are meant to familiarize you with uh, what, you know, the basically the uh, uh, radon transform is doing. Now, the radon transform is taking the your object, taking the projections, and mapping them to that function GL theta that we uh, talked about. Uh, so it's a basically a summation of all of those. Um, and it's uh, uh, interesting to to play with it in in MATLAB. MATLAB has um, an inverse radon and a radon transform function built in uh, that you can use. Uh, so you can get um, sort of firsthand visceral experience of what these transforms do to specific images uh, by uh, knocking them around uh, inside MATLAB. And so there'll be two uh, MATLAB scripts in the uh, modules, and one is called a radon transform versus sampling. And that's this one here. And these scripts are meant to be really easy to modify and use in the sense that um, you can pick an image that you want to look at to see what the radon transform looks like, the GL theta looks like for that image. And then we can modify certain parts of the sampling to see what changing the sampling, uh, say change the number of projections in a sample or change the angle between the projections in a sample and see how that affects the image quality and, and what comes out. Uh, so uh, this one, radon transform versus sampling, uh, there's these four images. One is a central square. You can set its width. So let's let's set the width of the central square to 16. I think it's probably a 256 squared image. Yep, that's what it is. Um, and all you have to do is run the entire thing on a Mac. You just say command return and the whole MATLAB script runs and it plots a bunch of figures that are labeled. Okay, and then you can go in, edit something, run it again. It'll plot all those same figures with, with labels. So uh, in MATLAB, if you pull down, you have, if you look at the code, this is very handy when you write MATLAB scripts, you can have it, you know, give it a title such that when you pull down here, you know what you're looking at. Um, and so figure one, which is this one is the original image, which is 256 squared. And it's a central square that is 16 by 16, right? And one thing we can look at is the Fourier transform. What does this thing look like in Fourier space? So take the Fourier transform of that thing. And this is what it looks like, right? And so you, you know from our experience thus far, if I draw a line through here, right, that's a rect function that has a width of 16 pixels. And therefore, this is a sync function with the appropriate width in the Fourier space, right? That same projection. Um, so let's... If we go back to the code, if you go back here, we can easily just change the width of that, say 32. So I'm gonna make a bigger square in the middle of the picture. What's gonna to happen to the Fourier space? Does anybody make a guess, right? So here's the Fourier space for 16. So basically what's gonna happen is you're gonna compress this such that this frequency of oscillations in that function is about twice, or not about, it's exactly twice as high. So let's just run that. And so there's a bigger square, and now the sync function has many more uh, zeros or crossings. This is plotted, as you'll see in the code, it's not plotted as the real part of the Fourier transform, it's plotted as the magnitude of the Fourier transform with an offset and then the logarithm taken so that you can see more features in the background of the transform. Otherwise, when you're looking at the picture, it just looks like a, a central blob, right? So going to uh, GL theta. So if this is our image, which is a, a really simple image, and now we want to uh, plot out, well, what does 
the function gl theta look like. Uh, this is the uh, value of that function. And uh, so this is in the theta direction. This is in the L direction, right? And so as we change theta values, we get different projections such that when we start, we're obviously all of the values along here look like they're about the same, right? So that's either a vertical or a horizontal projection through that, that uh, function, right? Because it's all zeros. It goes up to a rect and then goes back down. So that's one of the two. It's either horizontal or vertical projection. And then as we go to a 45 degree, you can see that the integral through the middle gets brighter. So and that's because this is a longer path through the object and this is a shorter path, right? And so you, you get lower values off to the edge and you get a cyclical behavior of that as you rotate around, make those projections. Uh, you can take the inverse radon transform of this set of data. And we looked at the, we'll look at it briefly again, the inverse radon transform was when we did that integral, we got the G star theta convolved with the Fourier transform of the ramp function. And we inverted that by doing Bra projection of those. We can do that in MATLAB and uh, we get this, All right? So you can see there's slight differences between all zeros and ones in the middle versus this. We have some a few streaks off the side here. I don't know if that's visible there, probably not that visible. Uh, actually in MATLAB, if you want to look at the details in the background, uh, this one, so this is figure five. So I think, I think we can say figure five, to set figure five and then say M contrast and it'll bring up a it should bring up a window there it is okay so it brings up this window so <clears throat> the center of our brightness here uh, looks like it's at 0.5 right and the width is one so if we want to look at more features say down towards the baseline we could set this to 0 0.1 right and we'll go down the, the center of our display will, will drop. So now we're seeing more features in the background, right? So that's just a little trick with MATLAB. If you, if you can't really see what's going on in the picture and you need to adjust the window, center and window of that picture, right? Use M contrast. Um, so let's actually, let's just run this again so that we get everything back up top here. Okay. And, and then we can ask questions like, well, if I don't have time to get all of these views, right? Uh, say I could only get half of them. And so what does a, the inverse rate on transform look like if I just take half of these views by chopping off the first you know, quarter and the last quarter, right? So here's my new data. It's obviously, a subset of the data from all of the projection angles, right? I, now I don't have all the angles. I just have 90 degrees, probably 45 to, yeah, nine. Yeah. So, you know, if I only have that much data and I take the inverse rate on transform of that, what does it look like? It looks like this. Okay. So we obviously had a lot of data getting projections of this edge here. We didn't get much data of projections of this edge, right? So that's what's going on over here and over here, right? So <clears throat> this is, now we can use this same technique though to ask questions about what does a subsampling of our data look like for more clever algorithms of subsampling. And uh, for example, say you want to cut your dose in half. And therefore, I, instead of sampling 180 degrees, I'm only going to sample, uh, and I'm going to do you know take a thousand samples around that. I'm going to take 500 samples, right? To, how how does that uh, change the quality of the picture? So we can go into the the code and and ask questions about uh, sampling. And so, um, 
Let's see what we have here to play with. It should say adjustable. Oh, here it is. Adjustable projection sampling parameters. Anytime there's an adjust or adjustable, you can go in here and change it. So here, first projection angle was set to zero. Last projection is 180. And we had 180 angles, right, to do that. Um, so let's do this. Let's say we'll set this to five. Right, so we now we're taking one fifth of the data because we're just going to take a projection every five degrees instead of every one degree. Let's see what that does to this this thing. <clears throat> so that's what it looks like, right? So now this function, this sampling function, Figure Four, it only has uh, you know about forty uh, angles here or thirty eight angles here, right? Uh, because <clears throat> We're, we're taking them only over five degrees. This is not the uh, degrees, this is just the sample number in the angular direction. And so with a lower number of samples, when we do the inverse radon, we get a picture that looks pretty good, but it has a lot more artifact in the background, right? And uh, so there's a lot of more streaking coming off. However, you know, if all you needed to know was where that square was, you can now do it with 20% of the radiation we had before, right? So depending on your task, you know, this this could be a, a reasonable way to go about it. Um, let's see what happens when we go to some extremes. Go in here, let's sample every 10 degrees, right? So now we're basically doing this with 18 projections, right? Let's see what that looks like. Still not that bad. <laughs> I mean, this is now down to a low amplitude, right? So, uh, but it's still the structure of the thing looks looks relatively good. Okay, so that's one uh, way of uh, changing the sampling. Let's go back to one degree. And uh, the last projection, zero. Well, we did what looked like 45 to 135, right, in that, in figure five there. Um, what else? So here's the radon transforms that you can take. Um, oh, yeah, so this is the lower sampling uh, element there. Okay, and now the next function we're going to look at is the radon demo with impulse points. and We'll look at uh, what you know the radon transform or the or g l theta looks like for very small specific points in the plane. So what we do is we set up a set of single pixel values at different locations in the plane, and that's going to you know be our surrogate for delta functions in the plane. Uh, and then we have again first projection is zero, last projection is one eighty and we'll take a projection every one degree. So let's take a look and see what that does when we run it. So our original image looks like this. It has a dot in the middle and a dot out at the outer edges or multiple dots out at the outer edges. Um, I guess you can't really even see those dots in there. They're so small. So let me, to convince you a dots there, we'll zoom in. So you hit that magnifying glass and then you can zoom in on something. Uh, well, that's, let's go to figure one, which is the original image. Now, here's the original image. Okay, so if I hit the magnifying glass, zoom in on that dot, we see it's a dot. It's just one pixel, okay? Uh, so two is just the parameters of the run, so you remember what you did. Looks like we're using a Hamming filter for this, right? Um, our angles, and uh, we can add noise to to this uh, uh, picture. So let's go back and let's find where the no adjustable parameter to change the level of noise. So the data peak to noise ratio of that thing I just showed you was one. So not very high, right? So the when you took the, the peak of the data in your GL theta and asked, what's the ratio of the peak height to the background noise? It was one, 
That's it's pretty low signal to noise, right? So let's set it to 10, a more reasonable number, right? And <clears throat> so now we have an original uh, picture, which is figure one, which didn't change. Uh, the parameters of the run. Here's GL theta of the original data. So this is very revealing, right? I have six individual pixels in the plane, right, at different locations. And when I look at what is GL theta of that image, right, it's this function. And so it's pretty clear what's going on here, right, is that each position in the plane corresponds to a sine wave, right, in, in the GL theta space. Right? And the amplitude of that sine wave right, and its phase tells you something about the position of that dot. Right? So the dot right in the middle of your image kind of defines the middle of the image is when you have the detector go all the way around. If it's right in the middle, it you know the projection of that dot always goes to the same detector element in your detectors, right? It's always hitting the center detector element regardless of your angle, right? So as you rotate your detector element, it that dot stays, this is the L direction. So these are the different detectors. These are the different angles in this direction. At the middle detector, we have this one projection and it's that thing, right? It's projected there, right? If on the other hand, we move out, right, to these outer reaches. If our projection angle is this way, they all sit on top of each other, right? But as the projection angle changes, these four curves, one, two, three, and four, start separating, right? Until finally, we're at a 90 degree projection where they're maximally separated, right? And so at, if I draw a line down here, these are those three curves are those three dots, right? So you can generalize this and just say, hmm, if I had a different value in every single one of these pixels, I would have, you know, 256 squared sinusoids added one on top of the other, and that would be my GL theta, right? So it's kind of it's an interesting function, right? Well, what we can do also in this simulation is ask the question, well, if I have noise in this raw data space, and where does that noise come from? Here, I'm I'm shooting through air every time, right? And so there's there's nothing to stop the x-rays. So I should, if the system was perfect, I should get the same number of photons in each one of these detectors for every angle, right? That does not happen, right? And the reason it doesn't happen is you have electronic noise in the system, and you just have a random number of photons being generated per unit time from your source, right? And that's just photon counting statistics, right? So the values back here will not be identical. They won't all have the same value. You'll have noise back there and on top of your signal as well. So the noise-free radon transform is this, that's four. So that's, that's the inverse transform of this thing. Right. Now we look at the raw noise, which is this. And so what we're going to do is model noise by just adding uh, random numbers as a function of position to the raw data. So we ask the question, if we took raw data and I, and I had a raw data set in front of me and I did a region of interest here and measured the standard deviation of the mean and the standard deviation of that background, let's just add that to the, the whole field. And that will be the simulation of noise in our experiment, right? And so when we do that, we have GL theta plus the scaled noise, okay? In this case, the peak signal that we found in this raw data, I think was probably these four points overlapping, that's our peak. And we set this such that the value here is 10 times the root mean square deviation of this, right? And so that sets the noise level, right? Of, 
if I go back and say, you know what, let's let's look at something that's noisier. Let's say the signal's noise is only two. And so we'll run that simulation again. And we look at the, here's the noise field, right? And then here is, the noise field doesn't have to change. It can just be a root mean square deviation. It's gonna get scaled when we put it on top of the noise. This is our new noisy projections with a signal to noise of two. So, and you can see that the signal itself is starting to disappear into the noise, right? And, and so they, this way we can investigate what happens as the signal to noise goes up and down, right? When we take the inverse radon transfer of this, right, which was what we learned, like, we'll review it in a second, but what we learned uh, last week, this is the image that comes out, which when you look at this signal, you know, it's hard to detect what's going on here, right? In the, it's really hard to detect those. You can see them, there are sine waves there, but they're coming and going as you, as you drive along one. But then when you look at the image and how it's reconstructed, it's not bad, right? Signal to noise for that dot. And that's because all of the signal power in this sine wave is in that dot now, right? So it's just added up and it goes into that dot. And so that gives you, looks like a better signal to noise on this side than this side point to point, right? So <clears throat> it's, th this is what happens when you look at raw data in CT research and you try and find things in the raw projections. Sometimes they're blatantly obvious in the image. Then you go back, you know, even know where to look in the raw data because you've got the image, right? You look in the raw data and it's barely detectable in a single projection. That's because that image came from essentially smart averaging for that voxel, a thousand projections. So things that are very subtle in the raw data can show up as, as fairly obvious in the image, right? So you can play around with this noise level and see, you know, where does something disappear, right? Uh, finally, uh, we looked at signal to noise of one in the raw data, right? So let's do that again. Well, so here's our inverse. So here, that signal is pretty sparse, right? It's hard to see the sine waves now. You can squint and kind of see those correlations along those sine waves. But then you go back into the, um, the actual raw image that results from inverting that. Let's take a look at this one. You know, that, that pixel is statistically different than its neighbors. There's no question, right? I don't know what, let's try zero. Five, where that, this is, I, I don't know where this is gonna blow up such that you don't get anything. Okay, it's getting a little shaky right here don't see anything except maybe it could you could argue there might be some kind of correlation there but then when you look at the individual pixels is that it is that it you know <laughs> so so it starts to descend away into the... okay one way of getting rid of noise is to filter and i think i have some filters in here yeah sorry here you go you can turn on smoothing. Let's turn it on. And what we're going to do is our smoothing kernel will be a rect function that has, it's three pixels wide. And so it's going to take every three pixels in the, which direction are we going? This is one, it's a row, right? In the theta direction and average them together. Right, and, and return that value. So this is a convolution of this kernel uh, with the original data, and that will smooth it in the theta direction. Right? See what happens there. So it's so exciting. Uh, okay, well, right, so we see we do have a correlation when you look at the raw noise field down the bottom left. And then you look at this noise field, there's obviously a correlation left to right in that noise field, right? There's a blur kind of in that noise field. And then you look at the 
image that results from that. And it's pretty interesting, right? It it actually looks like it has a resolution that changes from the center going out. And in fact, it looks like it gets blurrier in the theta direction as we go out, right, to higher K values or higher, I'm sorry, higher, you know, sort of R values out here. Um, but let's look at the, the signal to noise of, Right. Well, you know, that pixel is probably many sigma above the, the noise baseline. So you've detected that one. It looks like, even though when you look at the raw data, it's like, oh, I don't know. It's there. Um, let me come back. Do we check these ones? Let's look at this middle one. No, that's pretty hard to say you're detecting anything there, right? But it's it's smoother, you know, out here. Uh, you can try whatever filters you want. We could try, let's try filtering in the other direction along our detector. All right, so instead of along theta now, we're going to filter along, we have the detector, we'll just filter along there. We'll just average along the detector direction. See what that makes. Well, we don't have the, you know, blurring as a function of R as we go out anymore. Uh, we're averaging now in this direction. The center one still looks good, but yeah, they, these guys I think they look better, but it's still, for this signal's noise, it's still a little tenuous, right? Because you have very dark things, bright things. This is the actual object. This is the other object. Okay. Okay, so you can try, you could put another Gaussian in here. You could try putting a whatever you want. Right, just just build this kernel, and then you can filter it. Um, okay, all right. So that's those are the two um, MATLAB functions that I think they're going to be in the problem set that's going to be this week. You'll be able to build off these. Yep. I'm sorry. Say again. Oh, that's a great question. What is the typical SNR value for CT? And a manufacturer will usually, uh, for a protocol that you're designing, it will actually have a parameter that you input into the scanner, which is the noise factor, it's called. It's like, set the noise factor to five, Mr. Sulu, right, kind of thing. And so you can decide, right, what it's going to be. And the way it figures out what you need to get that noise factor is, two factors. One, it will increase the MA, just make more photons, right? Two, it will increase the filtering in the raw data. And the signals and noise will go up, but your resolution will go down. So there's a trade-off there. And we'll, we'll take a look at some of those trade-offs, but it, it's dependent on the application. If you're trying to find really little things or gaps in little things, then you need high signals and noise, high resolution. If you're trying to find a blob in the lung that is its average value is different than the rest of the lung. It's a different problem, right? You can average over a much larger uh, object and then your signals and noise can be lower and your statistics can still be okay. In the circuit machines, that's only go one cycle or multiple cycles are done and then images are average at each angle. You can do that. Um, you, you know, so they, so the, Question is like, do you always just do one cycle, make a picture and then you're done? Or can you take more angles, average them together and get a better picture? The answer to that is yes, you can take more angles and you and it's just like averaging after a while. You're not gaining any more information. You're just you're just averaging. The noise goes down. That's correct. And if nothing is moving, that's a perfectly fine way to average. Right. If something's moving. You know, you probably want to cut off the time over which you do that acquisition because you'll start getting different artifacts. Okay, so that's uh, the two MATLAB uh, functions that are in the module. So you're welcome to download those and start playing around with them. Uh, this lecture, there's, I think this lecture is from 21, this is from 22, these two links here. So if something isn't totally clear from, from this explanation today, you can go back to those and see if I explained it better last year, you know. 
It's one thing you can do. Um, <clears throat> and then if you're really interested in uh, computer tomography, you may want to look at some of these books. Uh, there's a couple of classics. This is a, a very good mathematical exposition of computer tomography. And uh, and this is a classic from, so it, Kack and Slaney is what, like 90% of people who do CT for a living learn CT from this book. And uh, it's it's a pretty old book, but it's, it's basically the classic. So if you go on to uh, Amazon and you just sort of every once in a while look around, you'll get one of these for secondhand for pretty cheap. Um, there's about, I would say, two to 300 people in the world that really know how to do CT. And they've all been trained on CAC and Slaney, right? And they, like 75% of them work in companies, right? So it's not it's not a really big thing in academia to have a CT lab uh, because uh, CT the CT industry has been pretty closed in terms of secrecy, right? Sometimes they don't patent things, they just keep them as trade secrets and they use them on their scanner um, and they don't publish them and they just, and historically the reason is that one manufacturer ran away with the, the business by figuring out how to solve an early artifact. It was like scanning through the skull, like sort of ex trying to scan soft tissue in the brain is really hard because the skull is such a hard thing and it gives off so much artifact. And they figured out how to do that. They didn't publish it. They didn't patent it. They just kept it. And they and basically they were the people who had these great pictures and it and they they captured like eighty percent of the market, right? So that kind of set the historical, you know, uh, standard for CT was like we just keep things to ourselves, <laughs> you know. So whereas MR, you know, MR was it grew out of universities and basically every company lets you sign an agreement such that you can reprogram the scanner however the heck you want. As long as you, if you blow it up, it's your problem. But the, you know, and so you go to the SMRM meeting where, uh, you know, medical physicists and scientists are using MRI. And at that meeting, there's 6,000 people there, right? And everybody's, you know, programming scanners. In CT, you go to the big CT meeting and there's 250 people there who really know how to program a scanner. It's a very interesting dynamic in those two industries so um <clears throat> and i've been in both i spent 30 years in mri and about the last 10 or 15 in ct something like that it's getting to be long uh so let's go back to what we were thinking about uh last week at the end so we re review what we've got here and um if you remember from the uh, projection slice theorem, which is the, if you remember something, you should remember the projection slice theorem. It's really cool. Uh, such that if you take a projection with parallel rays through an object and you get that one dimensional function, G of L, and then you take the Fourier transform of that function and it gives you a sampling on a radius, on a radial line through the true Fourier transform of your image. Okay. Uh, so we have these, you know, samples in this direction, these red dots here. We can, if we want, take those samples, superimpose them on a Cartesian grid, and then calculate what the value is at each position on this Cartesian grid by using interpolation of those samples, right? Uh, if you're close to the origin, just by the structure of radial sampling, you will get many, many points, right? If I want to figure out what this point is, I'll have many values along these uh, rays such that I have to do a weighted sum of those values to get my correct point. As I move farther out, uh, away from the origin, away from DC, uh, it gets sparser and sparser such that I'm, I've got a lonely point off in space out there, right? So, uh, and this is where it, it came into play that we needed to use, if we wanted to invert this thing in the correct way, we needed to invert it 
using the inverse Fourier transform and polar coordinates with that, basically the, the K factor that, that came in from the Jacobian of that integration, right? And so here's our God-given Fourier transform of this God-given continuous image, right? So these are both, you know, wholly true. And this is just mathematics of what happens when both of these things are absolutely known, right? Uh, <clears throat> and so this is the inverse Fourier transform of the function that we've sampled, GK theta. And we reorganize the variables such that we have the integral with respect to K inside the integral with respect to theta. Remember, so this theta is just going to be fixed and we'll take this integral with respect to K. And that Fourier transform of the product of K times the Fourier transform of the object gives us this function, GL theta asterisk, right? It's still inside this integral over theta, okay? And recall, if I have these GL thetas, for, let's fix theta, and then for a whole set of Ls, I have those parallel lines, right, at a certain angle theta, and that was GL theta. That was one of them when it's projected back over the whole uh, space. And when I add those up over theta, that is just basically adding all of those projections up and back projection. However, when we're back projecting this thing, it isn't the same as back projecting the GL thetas. Remember, we've now got this G star L theta because we did this multiplication. Recall uh, that the Fourier transform of a product, right? When you take, when you look into the Fourier space and say, I have a product here, I take its Fourier transform, it's a convolution in the uh, other domain, right? So here we have the inverse Fourier transform of this product turns out to be a convolution in space of the Fourier transform of this and the Fourier transform of that, with the K. And so now GL, G star or asterisk L theta can be expressed like this, which is the original projection convolved with this function. This function is the inverse Fourier transform of you know, the absolute value of K or the ramp function is called. The absolute value of K function is called the ramp. We do all this in one dimension right here, but remember K, it has zero at the origin and then it's like an upside down cone, right? In the two dimensional space, okay? So let's look at this particular function right here, which is GL theta convolved with this inverse Fourier transform. And this is what it looks like. Here's our GL theta. It's the projection of some object in the plane. We convolve it with the inverse Fourier transform of absolute value of K. And that looks like this. Looks like a sync function. It's not a sync function. It looks like it, right? It's a different function. But then we take that convolution and I get these things. And then I back project those to get the image. Okay, and that is the correct way to recover the actual values in the original image space. Because this is a convolution, we can equally well do this in the Fourier domain, right? So if I look in the Fourier domain, I take my GL theta and take its Fourier transform, which is that capital G, right? At, at this over here in the Fourier space, Instead of a convolution, I can do a multiplication times the ramp function, right? And that, in, the, in continuous terms, this ramp goes on to infinity, right? And the, you, your function will eventually die off, and the product will eventually die off, right? But this ramp goes on to infinity. In practical terms, you know, if you were going to do it discreetly, you don't do the ramp out to infinity. You eventually just shut it off and we say, okay, we're, we're done now. We're, we're going to do, you know, that much of a multiplication. Okay. And you take the inverse Fourier transform of that thing. And that gives you that filtered 
back projection, right? Yeah, you're back in, in spatial domain and you now have GL theta convolved with the inverse Fourier transform. And so it's here and you can just back project those just the same way. In, and then we looked at this example where we have GL theta and we'll give it away. It's, a, it's an ellipse or a disc looking thing. It has this blob shape when you do the projection when you convolve it, that projection with the inverse Fourier transform of the ramp, it changes into this, which is a completely different function. It goes negative. Here's zero here. I should have put a zero on here. It has the negative side lobes, right? So it's subtracting stuff off. And it has a nice flat top, which is more like this. Okay. And then when you sum all of those together uh, at different angles, you get the original object back without the blurring. Here's, uh, this is a, an example of back projections, uh, simple back projections of a square. So one of those back projections that say 90 degrees looks like this, right? It, it's just a uh, rect function. And then as we change the angle, right? The projections go through an evolution, right? As you go through different angles. And then the sum, of these back projections is down here and it shows up as this object. And so this object has sort of bright, a brighter center, it's got blurry edges, it's got a background which is not zero. Right? That's the original back naive back projection. This is what that function looks like when you convolve it, right? And so we can see it's got a lower top here. It has this negative side lobe here. It's got an amplification of the edge right here. And we're just going to do that at different angles. And this is what those functions look like at different angles through the square function. It's over here. You can see as it's added up, you get really sharp edges and a zero background. And that's what the negative side lobes accomplish. They give you back a zero background for things that are projected off in, you know, into an infinity. And uh, you get sharper edges, right, due to this uh, function here. So <clears throat> the original uh, algorithm and the one that gives you the true result is you, you in Fourier space where we have G of K, you look at the ramp function like this and you're going to either multiply in the Fourier domain or take the Fourier transform of this thing as your uh, kernel that you do the convolution in the spatial domain before back project. Okay. And this is called the Ramlock function after Ramachandran and like Shrim Narayan, Narayan, sorry. But it got shortened to Ramlock for, so you could carry it around. Um, and they were the ones who, you know, show that if you use this function, you'll re you will recover the object. There are issues though. Uh, if, if you've done any filtering at all in signals or systems or electrical engineering or anything like that, and you look at this as the response you know, of a filter or the bandwidth of a filter, this is a terrible function, right? You don't want to be going to higher and higher in frequencies and then peak out at those high frequencies and then just cut it down to zero, right? This causes tremendous, what are called ringing artifacts or edge effects, right? And it's not a well-behaved filter. If we have everything aligned and all of our dots are, are centered on pixels and stuff, it can work out to be the identical object. However, if things get shifted just a little bit, you know, in, in the continuity, then this, this function will give us some, some troubles. Right. And the real reason is that you're amplifying these high frequencies. And so you're also amplifying high frequency noise as well. So from a noise signal to noise standpoint, from an artifact standpoint, it's not a terribly well-behaved function. And so it became a cottage industry to figure out what function could perform what this does, right? And be less susceptible to artifacts and less susceptible to high noise spikes and things like that. And so some of those functions 
we'll take a look at three of them here and they're in the book. You can, you can read about them in the book. Um, so this is called the uh, cosine function where instead of a ramp, it's like one quarter of a cosine phase. And so it, as it goes to where you're gonna cut it off, it softens that edge and its derivative is zero at the point that you cut it off, okay? And it also, as you can see, cuts off at a lower amplitude than, than this one, right? So <clears throat> it tries to soften the blow of having really high frequency data amplified. And when you take its Fourier transform, that looks like this. So it's a slightly broader kernel, right? So it's going to average a little more. And the uh, negative lobes are still there. They have to be there, but their they their amplitude is also diminished somewhat. So it's pretty subtle, but it makes a difference. And then uh, this is called a Shep Logan uh, filter. And I have forgotten the analytical expression of Shep Logan, but I think it comes up. Uh, and but it looks obviously like it's some kind of derivative of cos, so it's cos squared or something like that, right? It looks like that. Uh, and then the cosine two is we've put in an entire half cycle of the cosine here, so that instead of having a, a abrupt drop off at this highest frequency we roll down to that highest frequency such that by the time we get there, it's zero, right? And so practically speaking, what this means is when we do our convolution back projection, I get my projections, I'm gonna convolve them with something. And I pick it from this, you know, these mug shots. It's gonna be this one, this one, this one, or this one, right? And on a CT scanner, there's usually about six filters you can choose when you're gonna reconstruct an image and you just select one. And what it does is it selects one of these convolution kernels and this one is gonna make the image look the smoothest, right? You will lose resolution, spatial resolution because you're attenuating high frequencies, but it will smooth out a lot of noise. Oh, we've got even more. Here's a hamming function and a handing function. And this one looks like it's it's got an even, it just doesn't go to zero. The derivative goes to zero here as well. So it's really smooth, okay? So one of the things you can try in MATLAB is take an example image uh, in that uh, um, exercise that I gave you in MATLAB and try these different filters, right? Just use the hamming, the handing, the whatever, and see see what you know what it looks like. And if we go back, I forgot to tell you one thing. Uh, if we go back to, how do I get out of, how do I get out of PowerPoint? Well, I'm stuck. Well, we'll do it at the end. We'll, we'll go back to the MATLAB simulation, okay? And, Okay, so here's just one example. Here's a Romlock filter, rectangle with a Romlock filter, rectangle with a Hanning filter, right? And, you know, no big surprise, edges are really sharp here, right? They're, they're rolled off here, they're smoother. There's more background artifact back here because these were, were having sort of severe signal from these edges being projected out uh, to other parts of the image. And here's some example. This is just a colorized picture of a phantom uh, where uh, this picture on the right was obtained using what's called the, when you reconstruct the picture, you get that selection of filters. This one is called the standard filter. So they have very, non-specific names. They won't tell you what actually the filter is, but they've designed some filter they like. And it's called the standard filter. And so it looks pretty good, signal to noise, right? This is called the bone filter. And they won't tell you what that is, but my guess is it's the Romlock filter, right? It's just 
it's hardly attenuated at all those spikes out it's probably just the the realm lock uh you know raw filter and so we have much higher noise values in the background right so this there's spiky noise in the background because high frequency noise can get through and we get these crazy you know signals which are like um aliasing or or a uh, or a, a uh, streak, multiple streaks that are coming off objects. Specifically, they're they're actually uh, dependent on exactly where that object is in the field of view. If you move the object around, these streaks will also track with the object, right? And uh, so you get these edge artifacts with this really hard high frequency filter. When you look down in the background, you can see the background noise is higher than it is over here, and the edge artifacts also project right down into the into the background. Okay, so when you're picking these things, you know, in in uh, discrete math that's done on the signal processing computer or the array processor that's doing the reconstruction, uh, it changes the continuous uh, convolution kernel right, into these discrete values, right? And so here's the representation of those of four different convolution kernels as discrete values that would be used on a computer for a discrete convolution, right? Uh, and so you can see the that transformation here. What does the rect function look like after it's convolved with, with these different uh, discrete uh, functions here, uh, this is what they look like. And so you, this one, you can see it has these very high ears, very low negative lobes up to the side. And then as we get to lower and lower frequencies or more smoothing, uh, it looks more like this so that these lobes are smoother, they, they extend farther out and they're not as high amplitude. So the, these are some interesting slides that show us what happens when we get artifacts or things go slightly wrong. And uh, it's divided into three columns. The first column is individual projections that we see through the object. And we can see our object is a disk, it's a circular disk, right? So this is a projection through a circular disk. This is what that projection turns into when we filter it with a round lock filter. Right, so we're going to back project these functions to generate our the image. If for one of those projections, let's say we take a thousand, and if one of those projections we get, you know, a five percent or a few percent blip on the detector because of some electronic noise problem, right? So I just get these blips when post convolution before we do convolution back projection we take the convolution and it turns into this right so these spikes really get amplified by the romlock filter it's because they have very high frequency noise component right and so remember the romlock filter it goes up and it amplifies these things at high frequency so a spike has really high frequency noise and so it turns out the amplitude of these things get quite big. And therefore, in just that one bad projection out of a thousand, you get this and you get three bright stripes through your image, right? So you can imagine if that happens a lot, for more than just one projection, you start getting a lot of these bright stripes of random you know, orientation. It's very you know, disorienting. So that's you know, the single sort of bad detector error. Um, subsequently, like if we have a 5% change here on the projection, we look at it on the convolved projection, back project that, it shows up as a dark streak through the image, right? Now, this one's really interesting. This one, this, this goes back to what we were looking at with signal to noise. If our projection is like this, and we have a under like about a 1% offset in one detector, right? So that detector is a little brighter, right? Than it should be, right? 
And so there's a 1% error in the brightness. So you can't even see it on this drawing, right? But then when you take the convolution because of this high frequency weighting, it shows up as a tiny little blip, okay, on this one projection. However, if it's an error in that detector, it shows up in every projection, right? So it's slightly higher in every projection. So what you get in the end is the underlying function changes, but this little blip is on top of every single one of those functions when you're doing the back projection, and it shows up as this ring artifact. So a ring artifact, you look at your scan, your image, and you go, oh, good Lord, look at that ring artifact. We've got a bad detector, and it's that one, right? So normally what happens is when you're you know, doing the, the testing of a scanner, if you get one of these, you just turn that detector off. <laughs> you just say, okay, we're going to ignore that detector in reconstruction. We'll take the interpolated value from the two neighbors. We'll do that. And no great loss, just one detector, right? And so that ring turns out to be an interpolated value, right? If you leave it in there, even at, even at this tiny, tiny level, right? It's a problem. So you can see that we really have to every day measure the gain on each detector element, right? Which is done in the scanner. You measure those gains. And then when you do your I over I naught, that I naught comes from a very recently acquired data set such that if the gain is changing over time in, a, in one single detector, you compensate for it every day. Okay? Otherwise, you get a lot of these ring artifacts. Even still, when you go to really low signal to noise, such that these artifacts are large compared to the noise background, you can still see rings. You know. uh, so what we'll do now is we'll look at the variables that uh, affect resolution in a CT scanner, okay? And in the book, this is equation 645 from the book, so I encourage you to read Jerry's description of this because he'll define it in much greater detail. Uh, but this is the, the uh, equation that he sets up uh, in order to discover what does changing different variables in my acquisition, how does that change the resolution and the signals to noise? And I think, yeah, I changed the variables. He, he uses this, whatever Greek letter that is, I don't know what that is, but he uses that one. We'll just use K because that's, it's in our Fourier space, we're always going to use K, okay? Um, <clears throat> so this inner integral here, we have our object, it's, it's God-given Fourier transform, okay? Uh, and we're going to take uh, the inverse uh, Fourier transform of that. And uh, so we have the, you know, basically the Romlock factor here from the Jacobian. This is the windowing that we're going to apply uh, in, as it as it is in Fourier space, right? So if it was a Romlock, this WK would just be ones, right? Because this would take care of the, the Romlock filter. Now, if we want to roll it off at higher K values, at higher frequencies, such as we saw in the Hamming function, then we would use this function to roll it off, okay? So this could be, for lack of something better, you know, it, it could be a Gaussian, right? To just roll off high frequencies. Um, <clears throat> this is the, what comes from detector blur and you have a finite width of a detector, right? And so if my detector gets more narrow and more narrow and more narrow, such that I have a very narrow rect function, when I look in Fourier space, you ask, well, what is happening to that function? Well, it's a sink function that gets bigger and bigger and bigger as the detector gets smaller and smaller and smaller, right? We saw that just in the MATLAB demo, right? As that square got smaller, right? The sync function got broader, okay? So if I have really small detector elements, then this function will be a sync function that is very, very broad. And it en encompasses a lot of high frequencies. If on the other hand, I let my detectors get pretty wide, 
such that I integrate across a very wide swath, then that sync function in Fourier space moves in and cuts out high spatial frequencies. That's This is accounting for the averaging of elements inside your detector width, right? So what is missing from this equation is the spot size, the X-ray spot size. And the reason, I don't know why it's not in here, but this equation is true. Yes, a question in the back? Yeah, I'm just curious. Like, why, why is spinning from zero to pi instead of 60 pi? around all the data. Well, you can reconstruct the image, um, the identical object from angle zero to pi. Because when you, you think about it, the math for this, the all of the rays are parallel. They're not fan beam. Okay. So when, when we're looking at math like this, we said it earlier, we're always going to take our right data and map it back to parallel beams. And so if I look at zero as an angle, right? And then I look at the projections at pi, they are identical. They're just inverted, right? They're just backwards. And that's true for all, all angles greater than pi. There, there is a projection inside zero to pi that is the same projection, just reversed, right? Like if I look, I don't know how to describe it. If I look at something, if it's sitting here and I project through this way towards the podium, I get a certain projection on the screen there. And then if I go over to the podium and put my projection here and I project back this way, it's the same data. So <clears throat> where it is, well, in a fan, and some of you might do this for your project, zero to pi doesn't work because you're missing some data when you just do zero to pi. You need to fill in a little bit of extra data at each end you know, to make that work. And it turns out it's like one half of the width of the fan. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the X-ray spot size, ideally is a point such that there's there's no uncertainty as to where that x-ray came from, from a detector over there, or did it come from a detector over there, right? It's just from that, we know it's from that point, I have a mathematical line to my detector. That is not the case in an actual CT scanner. An actual CT scanner, in order to make enough x-rays, has to irradiate a usually a rectangle on the target of some dimension, right? And the rectangle, the way you can think of this is that if I took that rectangle and I broke it up into a 16 by 16 set of smaller rectangles that are tiles that make that rectangle, I get an image from each one of those small rectangles as a source, right? And so I have a, a composite of images that each one came from a tiny little rectangle but it's not in exactly the same place, right? It's, it's shifted away from the center of mass of those rectangles. That's the effect and it's a blurring, okay? And so it should be in here. I don't know why you didn't put it in here, but anyway. Uh, so those are the factors that are going to defining the resolution of our, of our scan. Recall, we put a little tiny bead in, the, or I like a, a five micron tungsten wire or something in the scanner, image what this dot looks like. And this is our point spread function. Gives us the this width here is the composition of all of those blurrings together makes the point spread function of the, of the scanner. And we can think of it, so these are the images of uh, tiny metallic beads for different scans or different convolution filters, right? We Now we have the power. We can change from the Gromlock filter to the Hamming function to whatever. So we can create our own point spread function that way. And in Fourier space, recall, it's the modulation transfer function. So all of these things go together to give us a point spread function and a modulation transfer function in the Fourier domain. And the modulation transfer function, just to review from image quality section, it's easy to visualize in something like this, where 
as the spatial frequency gets higher, right? And our ability to uh, transmit that frequency diminishes, right? As the frequency gets higher, this is what it looks like until finally the amplitude of this square wave is now getting very close to just to nothing is close to just DC. And then finally, all we get is the average value. We don't see it anymore. That's when the modulation transfer function is out here and you just don't transmit that frequency, right? And we can achieve that by picking a convolution kernel before we do the back projection that really blurs the data, right? And so I've got, you know, in GL theta, I have my data as a function of L for that specific theta measurement. And I'm gonna do a convolution before I back project those. I can make that blur those, those data points, which we did in the, in the MATLAB simulation. And then that changes the point spread function, right? So you can buy a phantom off the shelf to see what your system is capable of achieving in terms of line pairs per millimeter or you know, cycles per millimeter. And so this phantom has a set of metallic markers on a constant radius circle. And so here they're very far apart. They get closer and closer together as we go around the circle. And you ask the question, when am I unable to resolve that there's a, a set of parallel bars there, right? We did a parallel bar problem in the problem set, right? It's like, what is the contrast if I put parallel bars? You know, no. And the point of this paper, which you, you're welcome to read if you want, because uh, these guys are claiming they have this iterative deconvolution algorithm to improve resolution, where they use standard filtered back projection or the standard convolution back projection that we have discussed. And uh, they, they see that with that, they get here before the you would call it quits and say, we don't, we can't resolve that. Whereas these guys get much higher contrast at this spatial frequency and they would say they, they can see this as well. So it's just a empirical way of evaluating what the, you know, modulation transfer function is. You just plot those. Manufacturers will, oh, I'm sorry, manufacturers will give you a value uh, of the spatial frequency at which their modulation transfer function hits some threshold. And if we go back to the function, a manufacturer might say, uh, well, you know, we can image out to uh, five cycles per millimeter, right? And they have decided that a threshold of 7% is what they're gonna call the cutoff, right? So you have to ask them, what's the cutoff? Because some will put it at 1%, you know, or 2% just to say they're out there, right? Um, and then this thing can also have subtleties, like it can go out far and then drop quickly like that. So depending on how they, they do the reconstruction. So here's just some examples of actual resolution in action. Uh, this, this is a human heart in a jar. And this is a coronary artery. Uh, the artery lumen is here. It's got contrast in it. Uh, the wall is here. And then this is a piece of calcium, right? Uh, it's, it's in a preservative called fomblin, which gives, if there's a chamber open and the fomblin gets in there, luckily the CT number is actually higher than tissue. That was just accidental, I think. Um, <clears throat> so, Here's an example of that human heart imaged uh, at a specific um, energy, MA, and spot size, okay? And so let's say we had, I forget what it is exactly, but we set it to 500 MA, right, at 120 kilovolt, and um, the spot size was set to small, okay? And so it creates 500 MA, creates enough photons, and with this small spot size to make this picture. 
if, and, and this isn't by accident, we searched around for this, you then ask the scanner, you say, look, give me 501 MA. It, it trips a threshold and says, oh, to do 501, I have to change the spot size. And so it goes to a double spot size, right? At 501 MA. So basically everything else is the same except spot size between here and here. And then this picture emerges. And so when you look at the difference, you know, this is still pretty good, right? It does have a much higher sort of peak right on the piece of calcium. Uh, you can detect that there's some kind of division between here, but not much between here and the fomblin, actually not great, but this one, it just looks like a continuous thing right up to the calcium. So that's, it's subtle, but it's there. And so ideally you image with the smallest spot size that you can achieve the MA that you need for that patient. And that mostly depends on the size of the patient. So if they have, a, if they're really big, then you have to use a big spot size. There's no getting around it. Then we image that same heart on my buddy's uh, benchtop system. And this is this can image at really high resolution, 3D high resolution. So he stuck the, the same heart. And this these are sort of scout pictures from his system. And so here's that coronary artery. Here's the lumen. Nothing's changed, right? It just moves the system. And this is the piece of calcium. And so there's the difference. This is a human scanner, right? That, that you get human CTs on. And this is a benchtop scanner. And so you can see the border of the artery. You can see a very distinct difference between where the lumen is and where the calcium is, whereas that is pretty well gone here. So depending on your application, right, uh, you can achieve higher resolution by, uh, you know, basically having a detector that do you can project this thing such that you get more points on that detector, right? So if you look at the actual value of a signal, so this is with the, the Ramlock filter or the bone filter. This is with something like a Hanning filter. GE calls it a standard filter. It's probably a Hanning, something like that. Ramlock background noise is high, background noise low, and the amplitude of the signal in this one, even there's a lot of background noise, but the amplitude goes up to, you know, 1200 Hounsfield units. Whereas on the filtered one, it goes up to 500 Hounsfield units. So it's a lot lower signal on this one. And it's spread over a, a wider uh, spatial extent. No question you could detect this object in either one of these data. So if all you're doing is detecting an object, you're good right here. When when problems arise is when you want to detect, you know, objects close together, right? And details that basically blur into each other. And so for single bright object detection, it turns out that super high resolution making it a really thin high spike is not is is not necessary. And we we learned about all of these you know, features that are blurring our picture. The spot size blurs it. The width of the detector blurs it. Our filter that we're going to apply before we do convolution back position blurs it. And so that's a sequence of things that are blurring our data. And so to get the full width half max of the total system, and let's go back to the point spread function and remind ourselves what that means. If this is my point spread function on a system here, the full width at half max is the linear distance at the half height of the point spread function. So here's my maximum value. I go to the half and I measure that distance. And that could be say 1.2 millimeters, which is what it is in a, for our CT scanner, right? That full width at half max for a standard convolution kernel. And to get there, uh, we have all of these features and roughly what you can do is each one of those features, it's full width at half max. You can just square it and take the square root of the entire sum and that will give you the end full width at half max that you've got, right? And so if you know what those are, you know whether that feature is going to blur your picture uh, considerably compared to the other 
origins of, of blurring. Okay. Okay, we got three minutes left. I don't know if I can get through this in three minutes. This is, um, let's do this. Uh, I'm going to talk about this slide. This slide takes probably five minutes, 10 minutes. So you, let's read this uh, section of the book uh, before coming to class and, my, and we'll talk about the slide. And here the, here's where it is in the book. It's 6.4.2 and these are the equation numbers. But what it does is it gets down to what determines the variance on a signal in the CT scan, right? So and we promised we were gonna discuss this, right? So here I've got a disc, I've decided on an MA, and I measure the root mean square deviation of the signal inside that disc. What determines that, that root mean square deviation? So you can imagine a lot of things, right? Like the convolution kernel, if I make it really broad and I blur everything, then the root mean square deviation, it'll, it'll be pretty smooth, but the edges will be really rolled off. How does taking more projections affect us? How does space between like the actual width of a detector affect us, et cetera? So that's what these variables are gonna tell us. Okay, so let's do that reading before next time. And we can do this right now, which is in literature, they often use this uh, test for defining the balance between signal to noise and spatial resolution on a CT scanner. And so if you look at this phantom, it has one, two, three, four, five by five objects. These objects have higher inherent contrast, right? They're absorbing more x-rays than these objects down here. So we have contrast going from high down towards low, and we have size or diameter going from high diameter down to low this way or spatial frequency going from low to high. And so eventually you lose down the corner here, you just can't detect there's an object there, right? Statistically, even if you know the size of the object and you put a circle and you, and you get the average and say, is there an object there? Statistically, you may as well flip a coin, right? Because the signal to noise is not high enough. And that's what this, it's called a contrast detail curve uh, tells you. So as you add noise to the system, you move this way in the sense that your contrast detail curve can only detect objects sort of inside this curve. So all of these are gone, all of these are gone, right? And it, it gives you uh, a understanding of how as objects get smaller, when do they disappear, right? At, at what size for a specific uh, actual underlying contrast level, right? So these, you can all detect these because your eye can integrate over a big disc and say, yeah, there's an object there. Whereas there just isn't enough pixels to integrate over to get a significant difference in the mean, right? So, and so that contrast detail curve shows that balance, okay? And it's, it's a traditional way of evaluating a CT scanner. So next class, we're gonna start with with this page and, and these equations, then we'll move on from there. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I know so there are a 10% grade for the participation, right? Yes. So how do we, how, how do you know that I already participated? That what's gonna happen with that is the, um, Participation is mostly based, it's entirely based actually on Dr. Liu's pre-class uh, quizzes. They come in the MR part. They So you haven't seen those yet. Oh, they come yeah. now we are in the CT part. That's correct. So it's in the MR part, we, ha we are gonna have the quizzes. <laughs> so the quizzes were released online or? Uh, I believe so. I think they're available before class and you can just do the quiz. Okay. Uh, okay. For the project one, uh, is that okay for we use Python to do it? Yes, it's fine to use Python. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Great. Hi, how are you doing? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, 